Cloud. I'm going to be making you host, sir, and then I'm going to introduce you after I make you host. All right. All right, everybody, while this is clicking over, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Matthew Escherbach. This is a whole new group here, it looks like tonight, Doc, not people that you've been seeing the other times. Um, so I'd like to let them know who you are. Uh, Dr. Escherbach is actually the medical director of EMS and Traumas in the Department at St. Charles Medical Center in Redmond, Oregon. And he's one of our co-medical directors here who helps out Dr. Frame. And he's taught for us several times. Uh, we really enjoy the lectures he teaches on the lecture circuit, writes papers. I mean, interesting guy. I think you guys are going to have a good time with this tonight. It, keep your microphones on mute, Chris. Uh, I don't know if you're coming in. You can hear me, but make sure yours is on mute. If you have a question, type it in to everyone over on the side, and I'll catch it. And as soon as Dr. Uh, Eschelbach takes a breath, I'll see if I can interject the question for you. All right, I'm turning it over to you. All you have to do is click share screen, and right. ch or you can click chat and then share screen, see what happens. All right, I will uh, share my screen. Thank you, everybody. And there we go. Can you see that all right? Okay. Slideshow from the beginning. Good. All right. Welcome, everybody. So, I'm going to tell you a little bit about this uh, particular lecture. You'll see that it says Stroke Update 2018. In 2005, yes, I know that's a long time ago, but in 2005, I wrote a, a lecture that I gave at the Oregon EMS conference that said, neurologic emergencies, hurry up and wait. The American uh, Heart Association had just entered stroke in at that time to the ACLS algorithms. And of course, uh, of course, all the uh, paramedics were very eager to get things going. We were talking at that time about heart one, meaning somebody's having a STEMI and getting EKGs read in the field. And we were trying to get uh, paramedics to get patients to the hospital. And they were frustrated because you rushed to get them to the hospital and they got there and they got crickets on the other end. So that's not what we are doing today, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that as we go along. Interestingly enough, in yesterday's newspaper in Los Angeles, they actually have a dedicated stroke ambulance. Inside that ambulance, they have a CAT scan. They've got a robot and a nurse who can do a quick neurologic exam. The robot can transmit to the uh, medical center so that a neurologist or emergency room physician can look at the robot and see what the paramedics are seeing and they've also got a CAT scan in there and that CAT scan will be able to quickly and efficiently do a CAT scan on a patient and then decide do we put a needle in this person and give them some clot busting agents. So really that's state-of-the-art and it's being uh, worked on in Los Angeles. Too bad not here in Central Oregon. So this, this is a basic nerve cell. I'm not going to go over it too much other than the fact that you've seen it up before in your text. Up here is the top of the dendrites. These dendrites right here talk to the bottom of the cell at the synaptic knobs to another new nerve cell. So the top of this funny looking thing here talks to the bottom of another one here. What's very, very important to know is that the nerves are very, very sensitive to oxygen, meaning that if they don't get enough oxygen, they can quickly die. Thankfully, we've got billions and billions of cells, I sound like Carl Sagan, but billions and billions of cells in our brain. So when we get a bump to the head or a concussion and some of these brain cells die, uh, we can do without it. But in a stroke, lots of these die, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes. This shows very quickly down here at the bottom in the synaptic knobs is where this next cell is. The electrical charges go across this junction here, and whatever is in here is released across. For example, if it's just a plain old nerve cell, these are neurotransmitters that go from the left side to the right side, 
and that signal goes across the nerve. Or if it's something like Parkinson's disease, it might be something like dopamine that goes from here to there. And if it doesn't happen, then that's when you get the effects of Parkinson's disease. So all nerve cells have the same thing. Whether that synapse is putting speech across this nerve cell or whether or not it's your deep tendon reflex, whatever it is, that's how nerve cells work. So we're gonna talk a little bit about stroke victims. Stroke victims of why do I have this lecture in 2005 and why have I not changed it a whole lot? And the basic anatomy is almost exactly the same. Strokes haven't changed, but the treatment has changed. So when I went back to this 2005 lecture to look at it, I was nice to know that the anatomy didn't change. There's nothing on the physical exam that changed. It's just some of our treatment and recognition has changed. So this is an x-ray. In the emergency department or in the neurologic intervention department, we can put dye inside the vein and take a picture of the brain. On the left is the left middle cerebral artery that has a clot in it. You can't see the clot, but right here is where you should have circulation. In, just like in a heart attack, a stroke is a brain attack. So what you're trying to do is put something into the vessel and open that part of the vessel. So if you're looking at this, imagine that a person's nose is staring right at you and the back of the head is there and the brain kind of goes here. So the circulation to the brain in this slide is not there and you can see once they remove the clot, all that blood gets in there. On the right is normal on the left is stroke, and I'll show you that in a few more pictures. So what is a stroke? These are words for a stroke. Obviously, stroke. CVA is called a cerebral vascular accident. Some people call it a brain attack, and apoplexy is a very, very old term, something you might see in a Sherlock Holmes type of book, but apoplexy is also another name for a stroke. They're all the same thing. The brain right here lacks oxygen, and that's when we get symptoms. So this is an old slide, and where we are today in 2005, the public is poorly informed, response time is too slow, presentation is too late, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Hospitals are ill-prepared, and there's a fatalistic view of a stroke. Now, what do I mean by presentation too late? When I wrote this slide back in 2005, you had exactly three hours of a window to give somebody TPA or clot busting agents uh, before they needed to say, well, we've done everything we can. Then they pushed it to four hours and then they kind of pushed it to six and now it's up to 24 hours, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a minute. Hospitals are ill-prepared, and the answer is no longer, and I'll talk to you about that. So where we are in today, the public is informed, and I'll show you, uh, we have cards that uh, people hand out. I thought I had one right here, but maybe I misplaced it, but it's a simple card that you hand out to the public and it has the FAST exam on it, and I'll show you that in just a minute. Response time is better, and it's not your response time, meaning paramedics, you guys get to the scene, you guys do lights and sirens, you get that going pretty quickly. That's not the problem, the response time is on our end in the emergency department. Presentation is never too late. Well, we've pushed that presentation out now to 24 hours, there's some literature out there right now that says if you remove that clot within 24 hours, the brain has a chance to recover. Uh, we'll see how we uh, go with that, but that's the newest technology. Hospitals are better prepared. We have, just like a heart attack, we get a call from you guys that says we have a stroke one, 
And that means that we clear the table, we get anybody off the CAT scan who's elective, unless we have a trauma, and we clear the table for that patient. Just the other day, I was working in the hospital and I got there and there's a note hanging up. And it says, CAT scan down from nine to 10 for repair. So I walked down to the radiologist, I walked down there and said, what's going on with the hospital? And when will the CAT scan be up? And they said, it's gonna be down for exactly one hour. And I said, okay, then we need to go on divert for one hour. We could take trauma, but American Heart Association says, if your CAT scan is down, you have to divert. So we were on divert for one hour while they put the CAT scan back together. Optimistic view because we're not pessimistic and clearly defined protocols. And I say almost, and I'll tell you about those in a few minutes. This is right from the American Heart Association. Uh, the American Heart Association wants you to get what's called the chain of survival. Number one is rapid detection. Number two, this number one is in the public's eye. Number two is EMS rapid dispatch. Number three is EMS delivery and door. That means how quickly you get them from the field to us where we can do a CAT scan. Remember I taught you about Los Angeles. What they're doing is immediately getting somebody into the CAT scanner right there inside their ambulance. ED rapid decision and drug. That means a physician looks at the patient, determines whether or not this is something else, and then quickly stroke unit and rapid admission. So what that means is in the future, if they do their job correctly, if a CAT scan's negative and they start to push TPA, tissue plasminogen activator or blood clot reducer, then we should get that person to a stroke hospital where they can be taken care of by a stroke team. More on that in a few minutes. The suspected stroke algorithm, this is what we see in our ACLS teaching centers, shows us a few things. Number one, support ABCs, give oxygen if indicated. That's the same with anything else. Perform a pre-hospital stroke assessment. We'll go over that in a few minutes. Check the glucose. It's a terrible, terrible thing if you activate a stroke team, you wake up a neurologist, you uh, run and bypass one hospital to go to another hospital, and you find out when you get to the other hospital that the patient has a blood sugar of 29 because you didn't check it, and you give them a little bit of sugar and all their symptoms go away, that's pretty embarrassing. Next is established time of symptom onset, last time normal. That's important, we still keep track of that. Even though we push the envelope out from three hours to six hours to 24 hours, uh, we have to keep track of that and get them to a stroke center as soon as possible. Alert the hospital right away by saying you've got a stroke one, we'll define that in a few minutes, and then activate the stroke team or whatever has to be done. Now. Uh, sorry about that. Number one, two, three, and four are easy to do. Your system, wherever you wind up, has to do triage to stroke center, alert the hospital, and activate the stroke team. So you might have a choice to go to three different hospitals, and you're going to have to have one of them designated as a stroke hospital as this system gets more and more sophisticated. In our system, we have four different hospitals. One of them is a stroke center. One of them is got an MRI and a CAT scan, and the other two just have a CAT scan. So as a system matures, you're gonna to have to make the right decision to take care of a patient. Here's the community link that we were talking about. You can actually activate and download to your phone an app from the American Heart Association for spotting a stroke. I don't know how many people are actually going to put this app on their phone, but it's something. Do you have a question? Okay. 
Somebody hit their mic there, so you might want to mute. Christopher Montoya, please mute your microphone. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. All right, community link. Um, you might have this app on your phone. Uh, I can't imagine trying to download this app as somebody's having a stroke, so you'd have to have the foresight to do it ahead of time. But the FAST exam is pretty easy. F-A-S-T, and these are the cards that they hand out in the grocery store and, they, and you can get them for free. A fast face drooping, arm weakness, speech difficulty, and the T is time to call 911. These are pretty easy to do. If the public can do it, paramedics can do it. So the St. Charles link where we are, we added a little bit more to that. Be fast, and I'll tell you more a little bit about that. In the St. Charles system, we have the balance and eyes in there, and that kind of makes it a little bit more sophisticated for the public. So if you recognize any of the following signs, then you might want to call 911. Obviously, if you're paramedics, you're going to be doing a, a more detailed exam, and we'll go over that in a few minutes. So what are the CNS emergencies? There's uh, types of ischemic stroke. Now, keep in mind there's two types of stroke. We'll talk at the very end about a hemorrhagic stroke, and that's why a CAT scan is so important. So there's no way to tell, really, by physical exam, if it's an ischemic stroke or a hemorrhagic stroke. An ischemic stroke is just like a heart attack. You get a block in the artery, and that block in the artery keeps the brain from getting supplied. A hemorrhagic stroke means one of the vessels exploded and blood is in the brain. So if you look at these types, ischemic stroke, they're all ischemic strokes if there is a blood clot. There's two types of those blood clots. One is an embolism and one is a thrombosis. An embolism is a blood clot that started somewhere else, like in the heart, and it travels and blocks the artery in the brain. So how do you get a blood clot in your heart? Most common cause is something like atrial fibrillation. We have atrial fibrillation. We've got an irregular beating heart. A couple of those red blood cells bump into each other. A clot's formed, and the heart pumps it up to the brain. The next thing you know, you get this embolism right here where you have a, a blockage, just like your pipes in your home. And there's a blockage in your pipe. You can't get blood to where it belongs. And then you get this gray area that's affected. We'll go over those in a few minutes. A thrombosis is a blood clot that forms at a clot. At a, I'm sorry, it's a blood clot that forms at a plaque site. I'll go over that in a few minutes. You can see both of these are strokes. Difference is an embolism starts somewhere else and travels, and a thrombosis actually happens at the site itself. So the definition of an ischemic stroke is about 80% of the stroke and what happens there is you get an embolic or a thrombotic stroke. You get a clot here in the artery, blood can't get through, and then ischemia happens on the other side. Less than 15% of strokes are from hemorrhage, uh, with even a smaller percentage caused by hypoperfusion or not enough blood supply. I'll go over that towards the end. So an embolism, is a stroke that occurs when a blood clot forms somewhere in the body and travels through the bloodstream to the brain. So you can see here is a, someone who died of a stroke. This is a post-mortem picture. And the forceps are picking up a blood clot that traveled and caused an area of stroke. Blood clots can arise from the heart as a result of atrial fibrillation at the site of an artificial heart valve, as a result of valve disorders after a heart attack or with congestive heart failure. So if you think back a few months, you'll remember that there was a race car driver 
Kevin Nealon, who is a comedian, and the late Arnold Palmer sitting down at a table talking about using uh, Xeralto for atrial fibrillation not caused by a heart disease or a valve disease. And each one of those people were taking uh, Xeralto. The reason they took Xeralto is they had an irregular heartbeat and they did not want to have the stroke. Emboli can also form from fat particles, like in a broken leg, tumor cells, or air bubbles if you're scuba diving. So an embolic stroke goes in, goes down, and then if it goes into a certain vessel, you get this area here, this area that looks kind of gray, and that area is called the penumbra. We'll talk about that penumbra in a few minutes and why that's important. So a Thrombotic stroke, again, is when a blood clot forms in one of the arteries in the brain and supplying the brain and grows and grows until it's large enough to block blood flow. So if you see over here, whether it's an embolus or a thrombus that's formed right here, you've got blockage. A thrombus can be caused from heart disease, arteriosclerosis, hypothyroidism, like a low thyroid gland, oral contraceptives, those are the ones like estrogen, and that's what we worry about with females who are taking birth control pills or oral contraceptives. It could also be, by the way, from estrogen, which might be given to somebody who's going through menopause or who's maybe had a hysterectomy and lost their ovaries, even if they're young, uh, they usually put people on estrogen. Sickle cell disease is another discussion for another day, but sickle cell disease happens when uh, the blood platelets fold on each other and they don't carry oxygen as well. Uh, sickle cell disease is primarily in the black population, uh, but it can be in Mediterranean populations as well. And coagulation disorders are when the blood clots too easily. So a thrombotic stroke we talked about is a rupture of a plaque. So uh, when you remember, go back in your mind to when we talked about a STEMI uh, or an ST elevation myocardial infarction, otherwise known as a heart attack, one of the ways that can happen is you get a plaque rupture. So it's kind of like when you have a party at uh, you're going to have a few people over, think back to high school, a few people over for a beer, and you tell a friend, and before you know it, they tell a friend, and before you know it, everybody and their brother is passing out on your front lawn while your parents are out of town, right? So that's the same thing here. A little bit of plaque rupture, all the platelets come to town, and they invite all their friends, and before you know it, you get a clot, and you can't get oxygen through there and that's what is a stroke. During this cascade is a bunch of brain cells getting killed and these brain cells actually die. The dead cells release chemicals that set off a chain reaction and that's called an ischemic cascade. You know when you sprain your ankle, when you sprain your ankle and it swells, the same thing happens in your brain. All those chemicals are released and they start to kill more cells. It's a chain reaction that endangers the brain and the larger surrounding area of brain tissue. So this is a, a, a picture of when I talked about the penumbra. So you can see here's a clot right here. It's called the thrombus because it, it, it is uh, generated at this spot. And collateral flow happens here when maybe there's more than one blood supply to an area and that area of the brain, it depends on what it's controlling, then uh, it might give a little bit of blood supply there. However, no blood here. And you get a thrombus, and then you get an area of infarction. Infarction is what we said, just like with a heart attack, these cells begin to die. Out here is kind of a, what we call a warm zone, and that's the penumbra. In the penumbra, these cells are dead and these cells are threatened to die 
And what we want to do for treatment is minimize dead cell area and minimize penumbra. So ischemic uh, strokes in the cascade without prompt treatment, that penumbra gets larger and more cells die. So here's a large section of the brain and the penumbra is large. If that area is supplying your speech or if that area is supplying your hands or legs, you're not gonna be able to walk or you're not gonna be able to talk. So pathophysiology, your professors who teach love to talk about pathophysiology, but injury or death of brain tissue is from interruption of blood and it can be caused by ischemic or hemorrhagic lesions. We already talked about that. And sometimes you get a sudden loss of consciousness followed by paralysis, which may be caused by hemorrhage, embolism, or thrombus. I'll go over each of those in a few minutes. So history is paramount. You wanna find out, have they had a stroke in the past? It's very important because you might show up to somebody who's had a stroke before and if they have a very, very dense left-sided stroke and you show up and now they still have a left-sided stroke, you don't wanna alert everybody if they've had a previous stroke before. What time did it happen? You wanna try and be specific. And you have to learn to ask questions specifically. So that means that grandma and grandpa are sitting in their chair and they're fine and they're watching Jeopardy and after Jeopardy's over, Grandpa has a droopy face and can't talk. Then you know it's they were he was fine at seven, and the last time, and at seven thirty now, just guessing whatever time Jeopardy's on in your region, you got to figure that out. At seven thirty, he had symptoms, and the clock starts back to the last known normal time. Are there changes in mental status? Are there any precipitating factors? Did they fall and hit their head? Did they have a headache? Is this the worst headache of their life? And we'll talk about that in the last few slides. Is there dizziness associated with it? Because that's a different area. Palpitations, that goes back to atrial fibrillation. And do they his have a history of high blood pressure, cardiac disease, sickle cell disease, or previous strokes? All of these uh, things are very important. And these are the things that your doctor is gonna ask you. Also, do they have diabetes? Is there a possibility, we already talked about this, that they have a low blood sugar? It'd be, and I've seen it happen where they call the stroke team, paramedics get to the hospital, we, we call the stroke team, and then a nurse checks the blood sugar and it's 25, we give a little sugar, and the patient's cured. It's really embarrassing for everybody involved if we don't follow our ABCs, and then check our glucose. All right, how do you distinguish a cerebral vascular accident or a stroke from a TIA? A TIA, what I call the, tell the public is, we call this a mini stroke. TIAs are a harbinger of something down the line. So if you have a TIA, you really should be evaluated. Some people admit every TIA, sometimes we send them home, it depends on how brave you are. Uh, because if someone has a TIA, the chances of them having a stroke increase significantly within the next six weeks. So a TIA is temporary stroke symptoms. They're usually caused by very small emboli. They can commonly last several minutes to hours, and sometimes uh, they spontaneously clear on their own, and there's no evidence of neurological deficit after the attack. So you have to be completely back to normal. This is a brain supply that I expect everybody to have memorized by the end. No, that's just a joke. So these, this is the brain supply, and these are the ones that are important for you to know. Internal carotid artery, basal artery, vertebral artery, and middle cerebral artery. And I'll go over these arteries and what we say. These guys, you don't have to memorize, but you, as I go over different areas of the brain and what happens, you might try and recollect and think that this is something that, oh yeah, I remember hearing about this in the stroke test or the stroke lecture that Dr. Eschelbach gave. 
So what I'm trying to say about anatomy is you don't have to memorize it, but you have to know that different areas of the brain cause different symptoms. And we'll go over a few of those. If you were to go at, into an autopsy, and if you were to see the top of the brain or the top of the skull taken off and the brain taken out, as you reach your hands in the skull and pull the brain out, you'll actually reach your hands underneath and you'll see what's called the circle of Willis. The circle of Willis is where the internal carotid arteries here and here meet all the important blood supply arteries like the middle cerebral artery, the anterior cerebral artery, and you can see they sit right on the base of the brain here as well. So a disease or a clot in any one of these can cause stroke-like symptoms. So the anterior cerebral artery supplies the frontal lobe and parts of the brain that control logical thought, personality, voluntary movement, especially the legs. Stroke in the anterior cerebral artery results in opposite leg weakness. So if you go back to maybe your history books and think of a man named Phineas Gage, Phineas Gage was most famous for having a railroad spike driven into his head as an accident way back in the 1880s. Phineas Gage was a railroad worker and somebody lifted a heavy anvil over their head and the hit the spike, the spike flew in the air and hit Mr. Gage in his frontal lobe. Back then they didn't have neurosurgeons so the doctor just cut it off and he lived with a large railroad spike in his frontal lobe. But he had rage problems, he got into drinking, he started fights, and his intellect was affected. And eventually, even though he survived his injury, he died because his personality was changed. Very often you'll see a stroke victim who cries. And you'll wonder, you know, are they sad because they had a stroke? No, what they've lost is their inhibition in the frontal lobe, and they're not able to suppress those emotions. So that's one other thing that can happen with a frontal stroke. Also, if you're an accountant, for example, and you have a frontal lobe stroke, that's not a good thing because accountants, all their memory and all their numbers are up here in the frontal lobe. The middle cerebral artery is probably the most famous one and the one that's most amenable or most able to be treated when we see a stroke, and that's why we go over some of these. It's the largest branch of the internal carotid artery, and it's the artery most often occluded in stroke. So it's very fortunate that the one that is most amenable to treatment is also the one that most often is uh, affected by stroke. It supplies a portion of the frontal lobe and the lateral surface of the temporal lobes and parietal lobes. So it includes the primary motor and sensory areas of the face, throat, arms, and hand. So that's why you see some stroke victims who have a dropping of the face, which we'll go over in a few minutes, difficulty swallowing, arm weakness, or leg weakness. And that's usually in the dominant hemisphere, the areas of speech. So if you're left-handed, not always, but if you're left-handed, like I am, you most likely use the right side of your brain. So if you have a stroke in the left and your dominant area is on the right, you're going to have worse symptoms. The reverse is true if your dominant area is on the other side of the brain and you have symptoms, you're going to go ahead and have symptoms on that side and you might be actually spared. Lastly, the posterior cerebral artery supplies the temporal and occipital lobes. That's the back of the brain back here and the occiput. Um, this can cause color blindness, uh, failure to see to and fro. That means backwards and for forwards. Verbal dyslexia, that's kind of what we call word soup or hallucinations. So that's why some strokes are very weird and people just, if they're having a stroke in that area, they might be imagining things like 
there's a man walking over there, or there's an elephant floating in the room, something like that. The most common finding of occipital lobe infarction is the opposite visual field defect. That means if it's on one side, let's say the right side, you might have a left eye problem. You guys don't have to figure that out. Even me in the emergency room, I have a very, very hard time and I'll have to look something up. However, a neurologist who's a specialist, he better know this and he's the guy who does know that, know this. And it's kind of fun sometimes to catch a neurologist who are very cerebral people and say, well, that doesn't make sense because X, Y, Z is the symptoms and you're telling me ABC. So it's kind of fun sometimes if you're smarter than your uh, neurologist, but it doesn't happen very often. Lenticulate arteries are very, very, very tiny branches off the middle cerebral artery. You would know this as what's called a lacunar stroke. There's nothing you can do about these, and we usually only see them on a CAT scan because this area becomes scarred. So the, uh, in conclusion though, the area affected depends on the blood supply. Again, you guys will go over this in a few minutes. You want to know where the symptoms are and you want to know what's different and it's up to the ER physician and the neurologist to put their heads together or their brains together so to speak to figure out what's going on with the treatment of this particular patient. So here is something that you've probably seen before and we're going to add this on. Now you most of you know about the Los Angeles scale, a lot of you know about the Cincinnati scale, all of these are forms of each other and they're in your American Heart Association books. But put it this way, if you have any of these five symptoms, and I'll go over them, sudden numbness or weakness of the face, arm, or leg, it's a simple yes or no check off. Sudden confusion, trouble speaking or understanding speech, trouble seeing in one or both eyes, sudden trouble walking, dizziness, loss of balance and coordination, that goes back to the be fast that we talked about, and sudden severe headache with no known cause. We'll talk about that in the last few pictures. This would be more than likely a hemorrhagic stroke or a bleed. So if any of questions one through five is answered yes, or the FAST exam screen is answered abnormal or yes, the patient is considered to have a positive screen. And what's the FAST uh, exam? Uh, have the patient smile and show his teeth. Usually, normally, they're equal. Arm, arm extended and closed eyes with palms up. What I ask patients to do is put their hands out like Frankenstein, like this, and then turn the palms up, and then they have to hold it. They have to hold it for a total of 10 seconds. And over those 10 seconds, you count them out loud, you can watch, and eventually if one starts to drift down, that's called a pronator drift. So this is supination, flying like Superman or Frankenstein, and then you turn them upside down, that's pronation, and then if you get a drift. Okay. Speech, ask the um, patient to repeat it. You know, last night I had a, a woman come in. She was 86 years old. She was as feisty as uh, she could be. She was at church, and she had symptoms of a stroke. And I said, please repeat after me. You can't teach an old dog new tricks. And she said back to me, who are you calling an old dog? So... <laughs> Anyway, I would say, no, 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 please cooperate with me. I'm not calling you old. Just say you can't teach an old dog new tricks. And then she repeated it. And she went on to look at the people in the room and says, she's calling me an old dog. And I said, no, 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 I'm trying to, trying to do my exam. Thank you. She was pulling my leg while I was trying to pull her leg. And then you want the time last seen onset. Is it less than six hours? And why, there's that six hours again. Why is that important? Because... If it's less than six hours, then we can push that out a little bit and, we'll, and maybe give some TPA. Or if it's less than six hours, can we get that clot out? But new onset of neurologic symptoms within the last 24 hours, that's our new window. 
24 hours right here. So three hours is usually what we do to try and get that TPA on board right away. Six hours, we've got to get in in there and, and, and we can pull that, put that medicine directly in the artery. Or 24 hours, we have to get that clot out. And this is a new study. It's just been uh, verified in the emergency medicine literature just last week is you've got, if you get that clot out within 24 hours, that penumbra is not big and we can pull that clot out there and some of that brain tissue can uh, come back. So if any of these are positive, then you can go to the CSTAT evaluation. And this is what's kind of new. Cincinnati stroke triage tool. We've been using the Cincinnati for a long time, but now we're kind of putting these two together this, the FAST, and the Cincinnati. And what's very important about this is if they have a Cincinnati or CSTAT, Cincinnati Stroke Triage Assessment Tool, if we have a CSTAT that's positive, it's very, very likely that they have a large vessel occlusion. Go back to those pictures I showed you of all those arteries. And if they have a large vessel occlusion, there's a pretty good chance that a neurologist or a neuroradiologist or a neurosurgeon can go in there and grab that clot. And I'll show you in the very, very last slide how that's done. Very easily, you ask them to gaze and can they look uh, in certain direction with both eyes? You're asking them to look left and look right. So you have to use your finger and ask them to follow. Not move their head, just follow with your fingers. Some of them won't be able to look a certain way. So if it's present, uh, then if they're unable to look, they get two points. Arm weakness. They can't hold their arms up for 10 seconds. We already did that test. And if they start to drop down and they can't hold it for 10 seconds and you uh, count out 10 seconds, then that's positive, they get a point, and their level of consciousness incorrectly answers at least one or two level of consciousness questions. Now that's very difficult in somebody who has dementia, or very difficult if somebody is intoxicated, or very, very difficult if somebody has some form of a prior stroke and you, they don't know where they are or who they are. So those are very important things. So if a C-stat is positive, it's divided as a score of greater than or equal to two. Here's that funny uh, look into the opposite side. Thromboembolic lesion of the right middle cerebral artery and uh, patient has conjugated eye deviation, left-sided weakness, they're not moving their uh, arms, or they might have unconsciousness. So that's where you get this try and look to the opposite side. So if you have a mature system and you have a stroke center where somebody can retrieve those clots 24, seven, 365, meaning 24 hours, you know, 24 hours a day or seven days a week, 365 days out of the year. If you've got clot retrieval ability, you can call yourself an, um, an interventional stroke center. So if you have positive EMS ED fast screening and a C-STAT negative with symptoms in less than six hours, that's what we call a stroke activation. If you have a positive ED fast screening, C-STAT positive, which we just talked about, with onset of symptoms, unknown and seen normal in the last 24 hours, those are also stroke activation criteria. So here's the difficult thing. A question has to be ar arise that if you're, let's say you're an hour away from a stroke center, but you're only 15 minutes away from a small regional hospital that has a good CAT scan and can do not only a CAT scan, but can do a CAT scan with dye, 
or they can do an MRI. Should you bypass that hospital and drive the hour or be seen in the emergency room as quickly as possible, get your CAT scan, and then the doctor in the ER makes a determination to give TPA and ship that person on to where someone can go and retrieve the clot. We're not quite there in every region. Go back to my first mention of what they're doing in Los Angeles, where they can do a CAT scan and they can determine if that person has a bleed or not. And that's, I'll show you in my last slide why that's important. And then if they are not bleeding and they're having stroke symptoms, they can start TPA right then and there and get that person to the right stroke center. So this thing here is from our hospital, call the transfer center with a stroke one, add CSTAT positive or CSTAT negative to report. That's a regional change. That's what we have here. What we don't have in every area is we don't have that clot grabber, the person who can go in and grab that clot, whether it's a neurosurgeon or an interventional radiologist or a neurologist who can grab that clot. So that here's the key though. It might be a quick one hour helicopter ride to a place where they do. So you might be bypassing the stroke center altogether in the future. That's the kind of a really exciting part to whole, this whole thing. So we've already talked about this. This was published as Cincinnati Stroke Assessment Tool in 2015. Uh, we've gotten to that point where we have a large vessel occlusion, and now we're finally moving towards getting uh, these things done. So what's the treatment by EMS? ABCs, airway breathing circulation. This slide has not changed since 2005. Stroke recognition, establish the time of onset, perform a neurologic evaluation, check the glucose, and then early hospital notification and rapid transport. What happens in the ER? In the emergency room, we have to deal with all kinds of what are called stroke mimics, things that are not a stroke that might look like a stroke. It could be all, all of these things. Syncope, they passed out, some type of epileptic seizure, some kind of migraine, hypoglycemia, you guys should have found this a long time ago. Hysteria, that's really, really hard to prove because sometimes patients lie about their symptoms to get attention or who knows why. Intoxication, so if there's alcohol on board or something else, it's very difficult. Subarachnoid hemorrhage is a bleed, a neurologic infection, something like meningitis, a neoplasm is like a cancer or a tumor, some type of brain injury, multiple sclerosis. This is really, really hard to figure out. Or peripheral vertigo, meaning uh, like labyrinthitis or a inner ear infection, not a middle ear like your children have. Uh, uh, inner ear infection causing uh, people have stroke-like symptoms. This is not something that I expect a paramedic can do. And it takes trained emergency physicians and specialists a long time to figure this out. Sometimes, but we have about three hours to figure it out if someone has stroke-like symptoms right away. Now, if people wait and then people delay coming into the emergency room, then time is ticking. That's why this clock is down here. You got to figure this out as quick as possible. Sometimes it's a challenge. Advanced diagnostics. These are the things that can only be done in the emergency department. Uh, clinical exam by a trained clinician, including the NIH stroke scale. That's something that we do when we kind of break it down into are they on Coumadin? Are they on blood control medicine? Have they ever had a stroke before? Have they had surgery? Because you don't want to give somebody who's just recently had uh, their appendix out, which is considered major surgery, 
or gallbladder surgery. You don't want to give them clot busters because then they'll bleed to death. And these are the things you can't do in the ambulance except, who knows, maybe in the future you can. A CAT scan, an MRI, an MRA is an MRI with dye so you can see all the vesicles. Diffusion and perfusion weighted images are special types of CAT scans and angiography is simply giving dye and looking at those vessels. Other studies like carotid ultrasound and cardiac echocardiogram, those are things that you can't do in the ambulance. Medical treatment, what can I do as a physician? Well, thrombolysis, I can start TPA, and it used to be up until recently, the standard of care was it was kind of up to the physician and up to the neurologist to determine whether or not to give somebody a clot busting agent. Keep in mind, we talked about those platelets. Keep in mind that the body makes its own TPA. So you have a clot and eventually the body will break down a clot. It won't do it quickly though. So what the drug companies did is take that gene from making the clot busting medicine and they stuck it in a bacteria like E. coli and those bacteria grow up and we kill the E. coli and we're left with nothing but the gene that breaks down thrombolysis. So that's really important. They do it with all kinds of things. You know, if you get bit by a snake, that's another way of doing that gene therapy. Uh, they do it with uh, diabetes medicines, all kinds of things. Clot retrieval, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. And then what do you do other than that? You put people on antiplatelet therapy like aspirin or Plavix. You control their blood pressure to a certain amount, and then you have what's called permissive hypertension. Permissive hypertension is when people have a stroke, their blood pressure goes up, because what's it trying to do? If you have a clog in your pipe at home, you use a plunger, right? Your blood pressure is trying to raise to get that clot out of there. So you're working very hard to get that clot out of there, so your body raises the blood pressure on its own. By raising the blood pressure, you might blow that clot out. So we allow, we allow a little bit of hypertension and then we allow it up to maybe the diastolic of 100 and, or 110 or so, and after that, we try and keep it down. So these are emergency department time-sensitive goals. So if time zero is when you guys arrive, we have 60 minutes to give this drug. So time zero, 60 minutes. That's called door to needle time. That is our goal in the emergency department. Now keep in mind that if people recognize a stroke, let's say we're going back to Vanna White, grandma and grandpa are watching TV and at seven o'clock, grandpa's fine and grandma looks over at 7.30 and now grandpa's got a facial droop and he can't talk. So now let's say 7.30 and then she calls 911 right away. The time goes back to seven and then we try and get them to the hospital as soon as possible. So let's say it takes 45 minutes to get them going. Our goal is to get that person through the system within 60 minutes. So at time zero you arrive, in less than 10 minutes, you initiate the physician evaluation and lab work. That means what I do in my department is you guys call a stroke one. I meet you at the door while the patient's still on the stretcher, and I repeat the exam that you guys do, and I will draw some quick lab work. And what we're doing in that lab work is we just want to make sure that the kidney function's okay and that the blood count is okay and the platelets are okay so that if we give this medicine, we don't kill the patient and we'll go back. Now, in less than 15 minutes, we wanna let the stroke team know that we've got somebody who's on the CAT scan table go into the CAT scanner, and we wanna let the stroke team know that we might need their help 
So we'll put them on alert. In less than 25 minutes, we want to initiate that CAT scan. Because in most hospitals, either the, especially in the middle of the night, if you call a stroke one, they'll wake up the radiologist or a radiologist somewhere like Australia, where it's the middle of the day, will read the CAT scan. Or the, if it's the middle of the day where you are, they'll read the CAT scan right away. So you want that person on the table as soon as possible. In our area, what we do is as soon as you guys call, we clear the table here and we say, get that patient off or finish your exam because we got a stroke patient going on. In less than 45 minutes, you'll have the radiologist looking at the image and thankfully, now everything is done by computer and he can look at that no matter where he is, whether he's in Australia or if he's right next door, he can call you and go, there's no blood in there and hopefully you can give TPA. What type of CAT scan you do is what's important. And there's that national stroke scale over here. And then less than 60 minutes, you wanna give all to place. I don't care what TPA you give, uh, bolus and initiate an infusion for eligible patients. So from door to needle, your goal is less than 60 minutes. And that's almost identical to the door to needle time we talk about with someone who's going in for a STEMI. The difference being is the needle there is how quickly the cardiologist can put that needle in and take a look at the heart. So what are the stroke treatments? If you go back very quickly to thrombolysis, we talked about just now, clot retrieval, what do we do? And this is what can happen. Remember those arteries we showed you? What can happen is a neurosurgeon, that means a brain surgeon, or a radiologist who is an interventionalist, meaning a radiologist who's trained to use these little things, or an interventional neurologist, a neurologist who has been trained in this, can snake this little clot retriever up here, he retrieves the clot, grabs it, pulls it back through here, and then he leaves a stent behind so that the vessel's open. So if it is the middle cerebral artery, here's your internal carotid artery, if he can snake it up to what's called the M1 section, and this is like M2, this is doctor speak and radiologist speak, but if he can get to this section and pull that clot out, all this penumbra here, this threatened tissue, gets oxygen again and brain tissue doesn't die. Remember, this is survival, so you've got, you can last about uh, three weeks without food, three days without water, and only three minutes without oxygen before things start dying. So that, your goal is to get that oxygen back to this brain as soon as possible. And lastly, this is our last one and uh, last couple of slides. Remember I talked about getting those people to the CAT scanner as soon as possible. One of the things we talked about is the worst headache of their life. So if somebody has an aneurysm or high blood pressure and they blow a valve or blow a vein or an artery and blood gets in there, you don't want to miss that. So this is a large front of the head CAT scan. Here's the brain. This, all this white here is blood. Or over here, this is called the subarachnoid hemorrhage. You can see little streaks of white. These are the two people that you don't want to give TPA to. Because if you give TPA to them, a clot busting agent, you've just signed their death sentence. So if you remember me telling you that I got to work the other day and they said the CAT scan machine will be up in an hour, no, that's not good enough because now I'm gonna divert people to another hospital where they can get a CAT scan right away. Because if I give clot busting agent to somebody who's already got blood in their brain, I have killed them because they're gonna, that brain's gonna keep going and going 
and it's going to look like this, where you convert a hemorrhagic discussion uh, or a conversion where you convert the small bleed to a large bleed. All right, so I'll take any questions. Uh, I should say, Dr. Eschelbach, may I be excused? My brain is full. So if you have any questions, please ask. Uh, let's see, Colin says, when you pull the clot out, are you worried about something similar to compartment syndrome with the release of cell waste and toxins? Well, that's a really good question, Colin. Um, I wouldn't call it like compartment syndrome, but I can see where you're going with that. What you want to do is reverse the cascade of ischemia. So, yes, as cells die, they release all kinds of toxic things like histamines and cytokines and all those toxins are released into the cell, but we have no choice. It's better. It's a scale. So if you're looking at a scale, you have to say release of toxins versus dead tissue. So, yes, you worry about it, but right now, we don't have any other treatment. Uh, perhaps in the future, we'll get somebody in a hyperbaric chamber and try and do that, but we know that too much oxygen can also cause that cascade to go on, and that's another discussion for another day. Uh, that's why if somebody's having a heart attack now and they're saturating okay, we don't give them oxygen anymore. It used to be Mona for all players, morphine, oxygen, nitrates, and aspirin. And now we're saying they don't need oxygen for everybody because too much oxygen can cause that cavalcade that you're referring to. So that's really important. That's a good question. Wayne asks, why does hypothyroidism lead to strokes? Is it an increase in cholesterol? Well, well um, gosh, I wish I were that smart. Well, uh, here's what happens. One of the things that we can have in stroke-like symptoms uh, is we have to figure out if somebody's stroke-like symptoms are caused by something else, uh, like a thyroid storm or myasthenia gravis. So hypothyroidism doesn't really cause a stroke, but symptoms of weakness are in the differential. So if somebody has hypothyroidism, they can be weak and have stroke-like symptoms. So hypothyroidism really doesn't cause a stroke. It's one of the things that we have to figure out, is this a mimic? Is it something else? Like a little old lady who's 80 years old and has a urinary tract infection and she's in a nursing home, she might be septic and have symptoms of weakness and it's not really a stroke, it's the urinary tract infection. So that's a good question, but what that slide was referring to was mimics of a stroke. Logan asks, how long does it take for the penumbra to heal after being oxygen deprived? Does it return to normal or will it be always compromised? <laughs> well, that's brain damage, okay? <laughs> um, that's a really good question. Let's look at the NFL. Everybody wants to watch the Super Bowl this weekend, right? Repeated, repeated trauma has now been linked to um, a, a form of encephalitis that causes rage, de early dementia, all that. It depends on what area of the brain is hurt and what area of the brain recovers. So I can't tell you exactly how long it takes that penumbra to heal. Sometimes it never heals. But the brain is an amazing thing. You can find a bypass around the brain. You can try and train different areas of the brain, and that's what rehabilitation does. I had a friend who has a brainstem stroke, and uh, he had a brainstem stroke, and his right side of his arm and his leg, will he'll always be in a wheelchair. But he's able to train parts of his brain to move those parts of his body. They may never ever get back to normal, but it's a really difficult question. So I haven't got that. We're getting better at it. And that's when we have to get to the metabolic things that we talked about. I think it was Colin's question. How do we get to those, uh, those cytokines and those toxins out of the body? So I don't have a good answer, 
uh, probably some PhD does, but I'm an ER doc and I'm not that smart. <laughs> All right, Wayne has another question. Why not give TPA to people prophylactically if they're at risk? What are the side effects that would stop us from breaking up a clot before it becomes an issue? Well, well, we don't give TPA prophylactically. Now, first off, one bottle of TPA is thousands of dollars, thousands. It would be nice if it weren't, but that's what drug companies charge. So you're talking a lot of money for TPA. But what we do give prophylactically is, if we go back to the slide back here, uh, here we go, medical treatment, antiplatelet therapy. One baby aspirin a day is about as effective as a full baby aspirin for treating atrial fibrillation. Uh, so most of these folks, if they have atrial fibrillation, are either on warfarin or Coumadin or Xeralto or Eliquis, and these people are preventing the stroke that way. The other thing is healthy lifestyle, controlling blood pressure, all those things are important. So we don't give TPA prophylactically because then if we trip and fall, we're gonna get a brain bleed like this because that's also what happens. Older people who fall and hit their head get brain bleeds. So now we have to be real, we have what's called a ground level fall protocol so if a little old lady falls and hits her head, we got to do a CAT scan right away to find out if we can stop this bleeding. A lot of these great medicines, Coumadin has an antidote. It's vitamin K and we can give it and we can give fresh frozen plasma and stop bleeding. Unfortunately, Xeralto and Eliquis, we can give things, but there's actual no antidote for it. So we don't want to give a $40,000 medicine prophylactically to people, but aspirin is a penny. Coumadin's a couple of pennies, and Eliquis are a couple of dollars. So there you go. Chris has a good question. Our local protocol has us treating with a normal saline bolus on all positive, positive stroke scales. Is there a concern with hemorrhagic bleeds? Well, yes, um, and that, the, there is some concern. Uh, one liter, it depends on the blood pressure and what you're seeing. What they're trying to do is thin the blood a little bit to push that clot through. Uh, you have to be careful because if there's a hemorrhagic bleed, you could make things a little bit worse and knock that clot off. The same thought process goes into what we call, you see the slide here says permissive hypertension. There is something in trauma called permissive hypotension, where somebody has trauma, let's say they have a bleed, and by the time the ambulance gets there, the body's done what it's supposed to do, clot off the bleeding. And then we pour two liters of fluid in there, and all those platelets get washed away and the people can bleed to death. So there is a little bit of concern in a hemorrhagic bleed. So it's kind of a balancing scale. I wouldn't give a full liter. I would probably, unless they were hypotensive. If they were hypotensive, I would give, uh, or low blood pressure, I would give that blood. If they're hypertensive, I would probably just watch and wait until I knew what the results of the CAT scan were. All right, class, any more questions for Dr. Eschelbach? Going once, going twice. All right. Those of you answered questions, great, fantastic. All right, thank you, everybody. Thank you so much tonight. And those folks, don't forget about uh, Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Texas time, for uh, um, Jeffrey Gibson, and he is going to be transmitting live from Kabul. Oh, cool. Yeah. All right, guys. See you later. Thank you. Thank you. It's the professor to coach the cipher. What guarantee do